After we submitted everything, then they said, yeah, yeah, now we have received all your documents, but can you come to the RTO office with all your original documents for verification? Yeah. So my point is, like, what's the point of applying with the documents online? Okay. So, this is Elston, this is Remy. Uh, uh, happy birthday, Rico. Happy birthday, happy Rico. Happy birthday, Rico. Uh, okay, they've come, yeah. over, they've come over to my place and trying to say all embarrassing things to me in the hope that I won't put it online, but I will. So, <laughs> it's supposed to be my birthday. I'm in my home clothes and uh, I don't celebrate. So, they are very disappointed. No, so then I will and tell you. Uh, I've been ungracious not to offer them anything. No, no, Rico has uh, hey. offered to, to, to issue, uh, offer us food, but... As is usual, when I usually travel to India, my stomach is completely... But I tell, so now we are going back on uh, memory lane, remembering what uh, things in Herald and all and all these kind of different uh, issues from those days. I'll just close this light, put off this light source. From those days. From the 80s. From the 80s. Tell us what you remember about the Herald then. We were talking, we were talking about many things. Remy, you told us once, if you get 5,000 rupees, you'll be happy. Yeah, absolutely right. And then Agreed. you told us 30 years later that you're getting 50 and you're still not, it's not enough. No, I told you, conditional, 5,000, that was in 80s itself. Correct. But I, I started getting half of that amount when I joined Navin Times. Of course, that made up for it. I was happy about it. But in... Uh, I remember you in Herald as a young boy, maybe 16, 17 years old, shivering in the AC room 17. with a blanket around you. No, blankets even were provided by the employer. <laughs> and you all were shivering in the AC and... But, but to forget all those bad days, it was a great learning place, point number one. Point number two... Uh, we also, uh, you know, uh, had extremely good friendships which still remain over the years. And uh, point number three, the technology was amazing in that sense. See, Raul, whatever we criticize him for, he may have not been a good person to judge uh, human employees. But his understanding of technology was superb. In Herod, 1983, we had access to Apple Mac, correct? Herod, Herod was the first to introduce computers to Goa. Before, Forget Goa. Before mm. Times of India went, absolutely, went absolutely, laser offset, absolutely. we were doing it. Correct? Yeah, absolutely, Rico. But I uh, I believe that there's like, you know, there's too much of a focus on, you know, this hagiographic thing about Raul and stuff like that. I think that let's kind of move the discussion a little yeah, ahead. Yeah. And let's talk about what Herald is doing today. And I think today, for me, the Herald is doing Goa a great disservice. It's a paper that has a rich heritage. It, it's kind of done excellent work through the 80s and the, and the 90s. And at various points, rightly or wrongly, you know, it's kind of like praised or, or criticized, <clears throat> but I think today there is a very, what should I say, it's a very one-sided view of the paper and, and mm. I think some, one of the things that kind of came, came up is, is this recent controversy of Lifetime Achievement Awards and Lifetime Achievement Awards for certain editors or certain journalists and certain, certain journalists are literally claiming that they need a Lifetime Achievement Awards. I can think of at least five or ten others that also need Lifetime Achievement Awards and I kind of saw this Goa journal, you know, Goa Union of Journalists and uh, the government, I think, maybe unholy nexus mm. in terms of the Lifetime Achievement Awards. You should be recognized by your peers, not by a government that I see as like, you know, with, with a very dubious record in terms of... Probably discredited know, itself. A discredited government and like journalists hankering for awards from a discredited government. Let your peers recognize you and, and some people do deserve to be recognized and not just one person like many people need to be recognized in various spheres so let's kind of take this take See, but discussion a little forward there are two or three things what you're saying is totally true I, we, can, we can and we should question the role that herald plays today in the market uh, at the same time we should not forget the role that it played in creating a new generation of journalists so there it's a mixed bag it's a very mixed bag it's a problem, it's it's a problematic kind of... No, no, I agree space. completely. The point is that today we are sitting down and having this discussion in a dispassionate way, in a way where we are not scared of like, you know, mm. the powers and stuff like that. And I'm still willing to kind of like go ahead and, and make these claims because I think that some of us were trained in a school that, that we were taught fearlessness. And for that, some of our former editors deserve absolute credit for teaching us to think. Rajan Narayan. Rajan Narayan, for example. <laughs> yes, but the point is that today what, what is happening is Rajan Narayan... For whatever reasons, he feels he doesn't, he requires acknowledgement from us and from people, you know, in a different way. The, the state government giving him an award would be, I believe, an insult. I think the history, the critical history of Goa, Goan media is yet to be written. Uh, we made one attempt at the 20th anniversary of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Herald in 19, 2003, 1983, 2003. But again, there are biases and other things came in. Let the biases come in, Rico. Why not now 
cover the, the cover the other period and encourage people to write let, yeah. let's have more writing it's yeah. never too late let's let's start that let's that is my intention that is my intention i'm halfway there but you know these projects how once you get stuck it, really no no start. remember See, one thing there are things Rico, it takes very hard to to start them and get them off the ground but once they get off the ground they develop a momentum of their own true and there are groups there's a, there's the goa journalist group or the herald group mm. on whatsapp mm-hmm. and i think it's excellent except that sometimes i see the discussions there kind of like focus too much on the past it's okay to focus on the past and use it as a launching pad to what's happening because i think goa is now at a point where it is very you know it's the the, the crisis is existential you know we it's like nice i look and read oh we did this in 1980 we kind of you know i hear people say i fought for the bus fare agitation and we got 50% have you seen the buses right now has yeah. anybody got into those buses have the same guys who fought for 50% concession ever got into a bus they all own cars now yeah. and they kind of you know they they all own cars and the, the roads are clogged in fact to to bring this more current the recent serendipity festival talked of they had a one of the exhibits was on road kill another exhibit was on garbage the garbage uh, exhibit referred to a uh, to a landfill in delhi okay very great do we but do, do we need to, if we are going to focus on a landfill in in delhi we can we uh, rico and me are sitting in saligaon there's a landfill problem here in this village there's a landf- landfill problem in the south i mean the point is these things are very good somebody said these are ideas and all but let's kind of localize this festival a little more then there was another exhibit on road kill road kill is great around the country so they talked of kaziranga and they talked of all these in goa road kill is not about animals goa road kill is about human beings there are too many roads there are there are too many vehicles there are no pavements people walk on the road people die And the, and the so one thing. question when when is your book coming out elston see you have got a ringside view to history and i think that sub editors are particularly well placed uh, uh, yes and no uh, they know the story they are seeing it from close quarters maybe they are not uh, the the writing type unless they push themselves into writing but there's a fascinating book in you and we've been gossiping since this morning about so many different things which we will not mention here on tape let it first come out in writing and uh, when is this knowledge coming out oh absolutely i uh, it's just that at this point i'm like i'm doing a whole lot of stuff so it will take a little longer but i uh, it's I a know, fascinating after, uh, story see no, because your 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 period elson sorry for interrupting your period is this 60s 70s maybe 70s where goa was at the cusp of change as much as it is now can i correct you the, the point is that the late 60s or the, or the early 70s was my childhood growing up where i have observations yeah. and my and, and my career in journalism basically started in the mid 80s no no i i know i know but i'm saying your observations no, 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 so my observations go back to the early 70s as a child when i kind of like i can i i can remember i i, I can just tell you share, share a nugget so when we came from goa when we came to goa from the gulf in in 1970s which part of the gulf oh i was born in kuwait and my father was there and so in early 70s we came and one of the things that we 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 wanted to do there's another thing i would tell you one of the things we wanted to do was to swim and there in the gulf obviously swimming in the sea was not uh, you know yeah. no one swam in the sea so you swam in a swimming pool So when we came we came into Goa at that point in the early 70s we wanted to go to a swimming pool and dad wanted to teach us swimming then we discovered that oh there were no swimming pools in Goa like you know in Panjim there were no swimming pools in Panjim at all then we discovered that oh there was one swimming pool and there was a swimming pool in Altin which was accessible to the army, army. now and we passed it off and dad says oh i don't have any connections in the army i don't know any army officers and you know if you have friends yeah. and stuff and i went to don bosco with the army all the army officers kids went to another school called shardha mandir and you know said so their buses used to come there and uh, we couldn't go to the army pool and we left it at that so dad taught us to swim in the sea and that was it it's only many years re- uh, later that i realized the import of the fact of what that meant what that meant in very plain terms is that there was a swimming pool in goa it was in panjim the only swimming pool it was owned obviously by the portuguese it was built by the portuguese when the indian army came the indian army treated goa as war booty so they took over all the establishments that the portuguese held so the swimming pool went into the into into the hands of the indian army which pool which pool is this there was one in the in the army quarters in altin okay. now the army quarters in altin were not army quarters the army didn't build them they just took over portuguese property what was it before now, 61 it would have been some it okay. would have, it, it's just like the signals uh, 
uh, all the structures in Panjim, right. which were all right. taken over by, by the Indian Army for various activities like storerooms and godowns and whatever. And, and the, even today, 30 or 40 percent of Panjim is still controlled by the army. All these were Portuguese establishments meant to defend a colony mm. against the might of India. There was no reason for them to come into the heart of Panjim and take over these, mm. take over. But, but the whole point is, we couldn't get access because I the see. Indian Army had become the new Portuguese. And the point is that <clears throat> it's only in the late, in the mid 70s that that the first private swimming pool was set up in Panjim by Hotel Fidalgo. It's only today now I realize that the reason we were deprived of that is because the Indian Army had become the new boss in Goa. Politics, politics. You know, I'm so I'm just politics and history. No, I'm politics, is no, no, no so I'm so I'm just pointing this out. Is that no? This is not my journalism. My journalism of the of what this observation meant came in much later. At that point, I only had the information. But when you correlate that information yeah. as a child to what uh, to what happened and put it in context that that you begin to realize. So the point is that even today, Goa is just seen as war booty for Delhi. And the point is that everything that the Portuguese is starting, uh, going as far as the Daboli airport. Yeah. I mean, Daboli and Mopa. Daboli is a, wasn't a military civilian, establishment. Civilian it, airport it, it, to start with. It, or a civilian. It was an <coughs> airport built by a colonizing power to link up with their, yeah. with their mother country. It, there was no reason for the, for the Portuguese or no, for the Indians to take over all these and claim. To, today they behave. And, and the point is that... But what aspects of Goan history need to be spoken about in the 60s, 70s context? As a kid, I'm asking you this before you enter journalism. You know it so well. No, I don't know, no, no, my point is that as a child, <coughs> there were only observations about, you know, the language politics, for example. I start, uh, When I was in class 4, I took Marathi. Uh, so, because my pa- uh, dad told me, you're going to need Marathi as in like, you know, uh, Marathi is on the ascendant. Yeah. By the time I got into class 5, I was told, no, no, Konkani is going to become the new language. So I, I went through school learning Marathi, learning Konkani, then learning French. All this is... The, but the point there was is no that, Portuguese. No, no, there was no Portuguese at that point. But the, 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 the whole thing is you realize the politics at play much, much later. Yeah. At that point, it was, oh, you have to study Marathi. Incidentally, when I studied Marathi, I topped my class. I see. And I had all... Um, um, uh, among my classmates was uh, Sashikala Kakodkar's son. You think? No, the, uh, uh, not, the, I will not take names, okay, the, okay. The, uh, the younger brother. Okay. And uh, th- there were other people, uh, Goan Hindus who kind of like, and the teacher would use me as an example to say, see, he doesn't, he's not, not even from here. I and, see. And, 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 and he scores <coughs> the highest marks in Marathi. And then I went into Konkani and then, and uh, after I went into Konkani, I began to realize that... Uh, Who were your teachers? No, it doesn't matter. My, I think my teachers were like Sir called Pai, but that's not the important question. We started learning Konkani in school and then I discovered that I couldn't talk to my grandmother because she spoke a version of Konkani that she... The, and she said, what Konkani are you learning? So, you know, I mean, uh, so this was a problem and then... So we were Language convert- politics are very strong. I was so, making no, so the we point were, the other day. No, so essentially we were... Con- convert- we don't discuss it. We don't want to no, discuss no, so, it. No, no, so my point is that when we were in the Gulf, my parents would make an effort to speak to us in Konkani for a few months before we kind of came to Goa on holidays so that we could speak to my grandmother. So when I came back here, I could speak to my grandmother and after I learned Konkani in school for a couple you of months, I, I couldn't speak to my grandmother because the Konkani I spoke, she couldn't understand. Sure. Uh, and you know, and she had learned and she could write in Romi Konkani. Letters, letters. Yeah, she, she could write Romi Konkani letters. Thanks to the language politics, with the, by the stroke of a pen, she was converted into an Ill- illiterate, basically. Yeah. So you, you not know, recognized. Her, her version of Konkani was, was not recognized, and we're still kind of battling. It's still, very sad. That's very sad. No, no. So the point is, all the people, all the journalists who claim <coughs> that I fought for Konkani to be made the official language, kind of forgot these nuances. Yeah. So yes, they fought for Konkani, but basically, some of the things they fought for have backfired. You know, and so there's a book here. At this point, we will stop this discussion because there are so many things unsaid, and so many things which cannot be said, and so many things which are waiting to be said. But I'm waiting for your book. Thank you.